Welcome to the Bright Vibe Podcast. At Bright Vibe, we believe everyone deserves to be happy. But in today's world, everywhere you turn, there is division and negativity. At Bright Vibe, we have created a global movement to bring 8 million people together who are inspired to live bright, live bold, and share bright vibes. Alone, it can be hard to change, but together we can change the world. Welcome to the Bright Vibe Podcast. So Dr. Joel Furman, MD, welcome to the show. So excited to have you in today. And I'm excited to be here. Yes, I've got so many questions. Uh, you've got quite an interesting background. Um, you know, not only are you a doctor uh, the, and, and either do or did uh, practice private practice, but you're also a, a figure skater, right? You're like a championship figure skater. So we've got that on the show too. I don't know how much we're going to get into the figure skating, but at any point, I, I think part of the catalyst for your uh, for some of the work you do today was because of your own injuries in figure skating, if I'm not mistaken. But, but that's kind of an interesting, diverse background uh, to kind of go from figure skating to be, being a doctor. So that's uh, pretty, pretty interesting. I like it. It's not that unusual. A lot of people in the athletic community and, you know, a lot oh, of um, world-class athletes go back and become medical doctors, you know, okay. so it's, I don't know. I didn't go to medical school till I start medical school. I was 29. Right. You know, I, but, um, but now I'm here. I've been a doctor now for um, like 35 years. I'm 68 already. I went. I started medical school at age 29. I've, you know, I graduated in 1988 from oh, medical wow. school. Oh, wow. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah, very nice. So what is the name? This, how do you pronounce the name of your you, the specific diet that you kind of follow? A nutritarian diet. Nutritarian. And this is the first time I've heard that word used. That's why I, I didn't want to say it. Nutritarian right. diet. So that's the first time I've ever heard. I've heard of a lot of other diets. I've never heard of it nutritarian diet. So what exactly is a nutritarian diet? You know, the word nutrition is in there, right? So yep. it means a person that's eating a diet to maximize their nutrient intake, eating the foods with the highest nutrient per calorie density. I'm saying that the most proven methodology to slow aging and extend human lifespan and to tame, and tame, retain our mental and physical powers into our later years are these like five words, moderate caloric restriction mm -hmm. with micronutrient excellence mm -hmm. or moderate caloric restriction in the context of micronutrient excellence. Mm -hmm. Micronutrients don't contain calories. They're things like vitamins and minerals, phytochemicals and antioxidants. And I'm saying if we eat, to get the, the high concentration and wide variety of these micronutrients in the right amount of calories without consuming excess calories, their normal lifespan of humans should be between 97 and 107 years old. So we're saying that we don't have to get cancer, heart attacks, strokes, dementia. I'm saying nutritional excellence is really can preclude the possibility of getting the same diseases all of the people in the modern world get. And we have this unprecedented opportunity in human history to eat a diet that's designed to slow aging and extend the lifespan of the human species. And we can take advantage of this. Our ancestors couldn't take advantage of this. I mean, when I was a kid, you couldn't get like baby kale and sprouts and microgreens. <laughs> there was no such thing as kale. There was no such thing as kale when I was a kid. I'll just be honest with you. Know, there you was know, not kale. Like there wild, was not. I don't even. Wild blueberries and right. shiitake mushrooms and all the stuff <laughs> right. we could get, you know? Right. <laughs> yes, there was none of that. And and I will say that as I hear you speak, you know, I had Dan Butner from the Blue Zones on the show as well. And and he would, mm -hmm. he would echo, I believe he would echo the calorie restriction thing as part of longevity when he studied some... Uh, as he studies centurions, um, you know, it's typically they're eating less and living longer and living healthier because they're eating less. And so if we were to think that it, if I presuppose that a 2000 calorie a day diet is normal, which I'm not, I know everybody's different based on their metabolic rate and all that fun stuff. But if a 2000 calorie a day is kind of normal, what, where are you at when you say calorie restricted? That's a great question. By the way, the average American is consuming 3,000 calories right. a day. You know? <laughs> right. And I always say half of what we eat meets our needs, and the other half meets the needs of our doctors, <laughs> if you know what I mean by or, that. Or our emotions, maybe. But, yeah. <laughs> right. but anyway, so yeah, let's get into that. I'm saying that when your diet is nutritionally deficient, 
and you're eating so much processed foods right. and animal products and oils and sugars and flours that don't contain these micronutrients, then you become an, a, an overeating machine mm -hmm. because your body is not satisfied with a normal amount of calories. Right. And the reason you must become overweight because you feel wiped out and fatigued if you don't keep the digestive tract in action all the time. Right. The minute you stop eating, you're wiped out. So you got to use food as a stimulant to keep your energy up. Mm -hmm. When you're eating a diet that has a high degree of micronutrient adequacy, you're not only satisfied with less calories, but you don't even want to overeat. You feel s full and satisfied with the right amount of calories. I'm not saying people should artificially cut their calories back so they're uncomfortably not uncomfortably eating too little food. Right. I'm saying we should we'll we'll instinctually gravitate towards the right amount of calories when the quality of what we eat is sufficient, and it's the poor quality of what the food people of what people are eating is why they can't control their apostat and why they have to become overweight and can't succeed in a diet. Because right. you just can't cut back on the amount of food you're eating when you're not eating the right quality stuff. So unless you're going to eat, you know, I'm, I want people to eat, for example, a big salad every day. Mm -hmm. And not the size of a soup bowl, but the size of a nine-inch salad bowl with chopped salad, mm -hmm. which includes not only lettuces, but also the green cruciferous vegetables raw, like bok choy, arugula, or, you know, cabbages mm -hmm. or kale and mixed in with sprouts and tomatoes and, and of course the onion family like red onion on top or scallion. Mm -hmm. And then might be other things in there like tomatoes or sprouts, but then you have a dressing and the dressing should be made with nuts and seeds blended with tomato sauce or oranges or mango, whatever the dressing recipe is. It's not made with oil. It's made with nuts and seeds, which have nutrients that extend human lifespan. So I'm saying right now, if everybody, that's one of my mantras is I want people to eat a big salad every day, at least once a day, because raw vegetables have the most consistent and powerful association in the scientific literature. More than 200 studies attest to that, that, with, that raw vegetables have the most powerful association to reduce cancers of all type. Mm -hmm. So, and the American diet, Americans eat 2% of their caloric intake from vegetables and it should be the majority of what we eat and they're only up to two percent right and and let me ask you this because you mentioned oil so because there's a lot of diets that you know even even in the blue zones mediterranean diet has olive oil so what what do you not like about oil um, well first of all let me just start out with the um, addressing the blue zones mm -hmm. the blue zones are not examples where people are maximizing human lifespan they're just somewhat better than the American or modern Western diets. And you don't you know, buy a car by comparing it to a junkyard wreck. What I'm saying right now is in the blue zones, they generally have more centenarians. That's true. Mm -hmm. But the majority of people are not centenarians in the blue zones. That's the majority correct. Of people are five, five right. to eight years longer than the average Americans. Right. I'm saying let's live 20 to 25 years longer, not five to eight years longer. I'm saying let's, let's not just let's do what's culturally... Um, or invite or locally sustainable in the blue zone, just what they ate locally, mm -hmm. but they don't have the access to the wide variety of, of, of um, lifespan enhancing foods that we have in modern society, like in the United States today. Mm -hmm. But in any case, so I'm not trying to duplicate what's done in the blue zone. It, They're yeah. often done. It's very narrow in the choice of nutri of, um, of fruits, of vegetables and fruits and mushrooms and onions and things they can eat there. But nevertheless, we can do better than a blue zone. And the next thing, the next thing we're talking about here is that when we're maximizing nutrients, we have to realize that we take in foods that have no nutrient load or an insignificant nutrient load, we're shortening our lifespan and we're diluting the nutrients in our dietary pie. Mm -hmm. So if I take more calories that have no nutrients with them, Got it. I've just reduced the nutrient density of my diet. And, there's, there's, and we have a tremendous amount of high quality studies on nuts and seeds as the major source of fat in diets for humans. Because in most of the modern world, particularly in the United States, almost all our fat intake comes from oils mm -hmm. and animal fats. Mm -hmm. It's the, how much fat is in your diet? 25%, 35%, 45%. It's all from animal products and oils. When we take, and I'm saying to maximize human lifespan, our fat intake should come from nuts and seeds not from oils or animal fats. Neither one of those should be a major source of fat in the diet. Mm -hmm. And we know that every study, and there's more than a dozen of them right now, that looked at hard endpoints like age of death and what people died of, showed that 
when you eat more nuts and seeds in the diet, you dramatically reduce cardiovascular deaths, cancer death, and all-cause mortality. So much so that you have at least 10 different studies corroborating each other that show that nuts and seeds eaten daily of at least an ounce to an ounce, and some of the studies show an ounce and a half is the maximum lifespan permitting effect daily. You mm. reduce cardiovascular deaths by 39%. There's no other food that was able to show a 39, almost 40% reduction in cardiovascular death just from the inclusion or exclusion of that one food, meaning nuts and seeds, could reduce cardiovascular deaths in societies by 40%. There's a lot of other things we're doing to reduce cardiovascular deaths. Mm -hmm. but, and we're showing, even in the, um, even in the PrevMed study, which showed that when people took um, virgin olive oil home with them in bottles, mm -hmm. and they used reduced animal fats and other types of fats and instead used more olive oil, they had some reduction of cardiovascular death by about 15%. Mm -hmm. But when they took the olive oil away and told them to eat nuts and seeds, then the reduction in cardiovascular deaths was 60% compared to those people who were eating conventional fats in their diets. But nevertheless, let's just look at this for a second here, because I'm saying that every nutritional scientist in the world has to agree that walnuts are healthier than walnut oil, and flax seeds are healthier than flaxseed oil, oil right. and that olives are healthier than olive oil, and that sesame seeds are healthier than sesame oil, because the oil comes into your bloodstream in three to five minutes, and the body stores it as fats. Fat, we say from the lips to the hips in five minutes flat. It just gets stored as fat. Mm -hmm. When we take the fat and this, from the nuts and seeds, the calories, the fat calories, are bound to sterols, stanols, and fibers that give you the calories very gradually over hours, and the body can preferentially burn it for energy instead of storing it as fat. And because they bind fat in the gut, they suck oxidized LDL, the worst actor causing cardiovascular deaths. The oxidized LDL is sucked into the digestive tract, and, some, and you have more fat in your stool. So oil is rapidly absorbed. It turns on fat storage hormones. It's fattening. And how does a person think they're going to lose weight consuming you know, 500 to 700 calories pouring oil on their food? It doesn't have the fiber and nutrient content to, to lower the apostat in the central nerve, in the hypothalamus, in the central nervous system, and it's an appetite stimulant. So we have all these overweight people putting oil on their food. And by the way, body fat is pathologic. Body fat spews out free radicals, suppresses immune function, and raises estrogen, raises insulin, you know, makes mm -hmm. you insulin resistance. There's no such thing as a healthy overweight person. Right. In proportion to your body fat goes up, you're getting higher rates of cancer, heart disease, and dementia, and you're aging more rapidly. And a male shouldn't have more than the male shouldn't have more than 15% body fat, and a female shouldn't have more than 25% body fat. That's the upper limit. I know my dog just barked. Oh, that's fine. If he yeah, becomes, yeah. He becomes annoying. I'll take him out and put him outside. <laughs> no, that's fine. I love it. I love your passion around it too. And fifteen percent, I've got work to do because I think I'm. I, I don't. I'm barely qualifying for the female. Uh, for the female percentage, let alone the male percentage. The um. <laughs> so, so I'm. So I'm glad we're having this conversation today. The so in your in your uh, view of how to eat, what would you eat throughout the day? What would that look like? And I know you write about it in your books, but for those of, you know, those of our audience who have not read your books, and certainly we're going to, you know, talk about your books as well, but kind of what would you eat? Right. A nutritarian diet kind of like takes out processed foods and junk foods. And if a person is, could do it on a plant-based or a vegan diet, or they could eat a small amount of animal products, you know, and, and small, but the, the, the main part of the diet is we're eating natural plant foods. Like for example, let's the lunch would be a big salad mm -hmm. with a dressing made from nuts and seeds, maybe a bowl of vegetable bean soup, mm -hmm. and maybe some fresh fruit after that, like a mango or some figs, you know, or some blueberries or something, or you know, some lunch or and so breakfast might be a whole grain like steel cut oats with a tablespoon of ground flax seeds or chia seeds or hemp seeds on top with maybe a plant-based milk, like an almond hemp, an almonds walnut milk or an almond hemp milk, or maybe a, um, maybe a, maybe some um, blackberries and wild blueberries and, and frozen cherries mixed in there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe, a, um, maybe avocado toast on Ezekiel bread with sprouts on top and mm -hmm. onion and scallion or something. Or I'm, I'm, getting, I'm actually getting hungry as you're talking. I'm like, <laughs> it's almost dinner time. I'm like, oh my gosh. I'm getting, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, maybe for dinner we'll have like a, um, you know, we might have a mixed vegetable, a Thai curry wok, mm 
you mm-hmm. know, with um, mushrooms and a lot, of, a lot of mushrooms in the diet are very protective against extent, lifespan promoting food and anti-cancer foods. So lots of mushrooms and Chinese cabbage and water chestnuts and bamboo shoots and snow pea pods and, and, and scallions in, in a wok with a, and maybe I'm putting that on some, on a bed of, um, of quinoa or, you know, or some kind of, or, um, you know, maybe my, what I'm putting on lentils or something else, I'm mm-hmm. putting it on some kind of um, bread of, with a little, a little more caloric. And I'm putting the sauce that I made with, um, with you know, hemp seeds and lemongrass and, and turmeric and curry and a date and some a teaspoon of peanut butter. And I made this delicious sauce for it. Mm-hmm. And I maybe maybe I had a delicious um, dessert, um, maybe a panna cotta with vanilla ice cream by, by mixing um, frozen banana. Uh-huh. With real vanilla bean powder and some macadamia nuts that I whip in the blender together, right. on top of an you know an, an an apple pie made with apple and no sugar, no just apple, just baked apples on a on a um, oat and you know an oat pecan date crust or something. Um, uh-huh. We make all kinds of incredibly delicious recipes. You know an orange sesame dressing for the salad or a, or a hummus or a, some kind of dips for the raw vegetables at night. If you want to have some raw vegetables for you for your dinner. And if a person is utilizing animal products in their diet, they're just using it as a flavoring device, like to flavor a little bit in the wok or in the soup or something, not having a big piece on your plate, like a big serving of animal product. It might just be a few ounces per person. Or if we're making a burger, you know, a burger with, um, you know, with oats and mushrooms and tomato sauce and what you know whatever putting almond butter in that burger or whatever we're putting you know a little bean mashed bean in that burger a person might make a um, one tenth of it they can add in, in the burger so they can add one tenth of the burger material oh, of the gotcha. animal product right you know and still make a great tasting burger with onion mm-hmm. and tomato and some lettuce on top with a if we'll take an ezekiel pe- i love those ezekiel breads because yeah, yeah. they're made of sprouted grains right and they're not high and they're very low in sodium right and it's a sprouted grain not flour so any kind of breads we're using are not the f- kind of high glycemic flours that are made with sprouted grains that are lower glycemic and more nutrient dense. Mm-hmm. So it's definitely a kind of like a whole food plant-based diet, right. but we're paying attention to the particular foods that have the most effect at lengthening human lifespan, which are G-bombs. We're trying to include the G-bombs every day. G-B-O-M-B-S, mm-hmm. which stands for greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds. So we're kind of eating a diet of half raw and half cooked, Mm -hmm. you know, fresh fruits and vegetables, but a lot of um, green, a lot of vegetables and and onions and mushrooms and beans made in all kinds of interesting and delicious ways with delicious sauces. But the unique part of a nutritarian diet is that all the sauces and flavorings and desserts instead of using oil and using eggs to we're using we're really using nuts and seeds as a source of fat and as a source of fulfilling f- flavor and texture to make the to, to make the um, ice cream or to make the to, um, spaghetti sauce or to make mm-hmm. the you know the, the salad dressing or something so one of my favorite salad dressings might be a thickened garlicky tomato sauce with sun-dried tomatoes uh, um, almonds or almond butter and some black fig vinegar whipped together might be a good a good salad dressing. Another salad dressing I might like might be a navel orange that's blended with toasted sesame seeds and cashews and some blood orange vinegar. It tastes really great on the salad. And I'll put some kiwi or strawberries in the salad too. You know, so it's a lot of delicious and unique ways to make food taste great. So where people are really enjoying eating this way and they're filling their body with a huge amount of healthy plant material. I'm I'm thinking I don't know how I get an invite to your house for dinner, but I'm gonna whatever you need for that to happen. I'm good with. I, I, you know I live in Kansas and you live in California, but I would be. I'm like so. And you have a you have a cookbook, right? I have a few cookbooks. I have the Eat to Live cookbook and I have the Eat to Live Quick and Easy cookbook. Oh, I love I have, it. And I have that. Probably have more than two thousand recipes on my website, where actually the members actually rate the recipes and give them the stars or how many they like. So it's a big part of the nutritarian community uh-huh. where people are sharing, sharing and rating recipes mm-hmm. and making healthy foods taste really gourmet. Mm-hmm. And by the way, um, I have a retreat here in San Diego that's open all year. Mm-hmm. So people come and stay here for a month, two or three months even. I have a, I had one woman who was just here for six months. But people come and they visit to lose, mostly they come to lose weight and to get healthy. Right. But I have these four chefs 
that rotate, you know, and they, and they make such incredible food. So I don't, so now I'm at a point, point in my life where I don't even have to cook for myself. <laughs> I, just, I just go next door to the retreat and I eat the meal somebody else was cooking. I so, love it. So I feel so privileged or, or spoiled that now, you know? Right. I mean? And that's where I want to get to. I, there's some stuff I'm working on here in the future that, that would be in alignment with that. Cause I'm in the same place where I'm like, Hey, it would be just great if this stuff was just obviously a lot of this is because the convenience factor, right? So we've been doped into this convenience thing of, I don't have time to make the food. I don't have time for this. So I just grab whatever's handy or packaged or whatever. So, so right. it would, it would be, there's a, there's a huge part of me that's like, you know, if, if this was just sitting there, I would eat it all day long. Right. It's just like if, you know, it, and so how do we create environments where it is there um, in some way, form or fashion, right. Where this is a right, part of our exactly. natural thing, right. Our default is, Oh, there's good food. I'm going to eat that versus I'm going to go over here to this restaurant and get something that's process, highly processed or highly packaged or right. This crap. And especially when you're a food addict and you're overweight and you're driven and biologically driven to eat those foods and don't feel well unless you overeat. Right. It's hard to make that change. And that's, of course, my career is making it easy for people to transition to get them to like eating this way, to get rid of their addiction and to make this into a business plan that they can put into their life. You know, right. most people there, you know, we show them how they could use frozen food a lot, mm -hmm. how they can cook on. They can make a soup on the weekend and the same soup, right. you know, with their lunch. They right. can make one salad dressing on Sunday nights and another salad dressing on Wednesday night, eat that dressing for three nights in a row. Got it. So we're trying to make it so people aren't in the kitchen cooking all day long, preparing food, make this doable. Right. Um, and obviously, the more people that do it, the easier it gets. But we have a complete you know, support system for people who want to get healthy. And what I'm saying right now is that the same dietary portfolio that slows aging and extends human lifespan has the ability to enable people to reverse their disease and to use it therapeutically to get rid of their diabetes, get off their blood pressure medications, mm -hmm. normalize their blood pressure, get rid of their psoriasis, their rheumatoid arthritis, get rid of their auto, their asthma, we could get rid of their chronic headaches. So we're talking here about the ability to use nutritional excellence therapeutically to reverse disease. And that's really, you know, what I've been doing as a career most of my life. Right. And I was going to ask you that, and this is a great segue. Why on earth did this, I mean, you didn't, you weren't born this way, I'm assuming. Were your parents, is this something your parents did? I mean, what, at what point did you say this isn't, either this isn't working for me, or was it just something that you learned from an early age, I guess? Yes, it was, it was something, I think I was about 12 to 14 years old. Mm-hmm when my father who was overweight and sickly and had various problems, including kidney problems, um, we, we spent most, a lot of the time driving him in the back of a wagon cause he couldn't sit up in the car. Mm -hmm. He was in a bed in the back of the, of the station wagon from doctor to doctor, you know? Oh my gosh. And, and then he read some of Dr. Shelton's books originally written in 1940s, Herbert Shelton, who was, who was one of the founders of the American natural hygiene movement. And so my father started changing his diet and growing his own food in his backyard and starting and putting a vegetable garden in and planting fruit trees. And mm -hmm. so he changed his own diet and lost weight and got healthier. So I started reading a lot of those books when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. And by the time I, you know, as you know, I was on the world team in figure skating. Right. And, and like today, a lot of world-class athletes have to eat healthy because we don't want to get sick. We got to keep training. We right. can't miss our events and we can't miss our training. So like I have um, a lot of athletes I have advised. And, and by the way, including the top, like top 10 tennis players in the world, the majority of them, you know, eat nutritarian diet kind of much. Or top, a lot of top athletes mm -hmm. um, eat like this to, make, to slow the aging process so they can maintain their athletic powers until, as they get older. Eric Schlappi was in, was from the United States as an, an American skier in four Olympic games. Mm -hmm. Who yep. I advised. Yep, I've seen who him. had um, and the point is, is that he maintained his career through four different Olympic games. Right. Where other, you know, so he just maintained a longer career because you age slower. So we're doing it as an athlete, um, not to get, not so we can get down the hill faster or or get the or, you know or shoot better, get the ball to go through the hoop easier. Mm -hmm. It's so we don't get sick. You know what I mean? So right. we don't miss training time. We're not getting ill. So it's about our immune system. So even like people like Tom Brady, Venus Williams, you know, who's got rid of, Venus Williams got back on the tennis tour after she had an autoimmune disease that took her out of play and took her, was too sick to play. And then she changed her diet 
and got rid of her autoimmune condition and went back to the, the back to the professional mm-hmm. tennis store again. And nobody's talking about that. She reversed her medical, her autoimmune disease with nutrition. Right. She's a famous world celebrity. Athlete, yeah. And, and the medical profession still ignores it. So no matter how many studies you put out, no matter how many people, even famous people who change, you still can't get the masses to understand that people can get well through nutritional excellence. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, totally. And again, it kind of, I think it goes back to just the over times as a society, we just slowly bought into this. It's convenient. So I'll go do it because it's convenient because I don't have enough time. I mean, everybody always talking about, I don't have enough time. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough time. And then, so how am I going to make time to make all this stuff? And then, yeah, it's just easier to buy the, even if it's, even if it's healthier, it's still packaged or processed or, you know, it's not what you're talking about, which is like raw, right? Raw foods. Um, well, it could be half raw and half cooked, but I'm, right. I'm also yeah, saying I meant, frozen food is really whole good foods. for you. Like, yeah, whole foods. Yeah, like frozen broccoli florets, frozen right. peas, yep. frozen wild blueberries. They freeze them the same day they're picked. Right. They lock nutrients in when they freeze them, and they're really still healthy when you buy frozen food. Right. You know, so it's not that hard to do it. I can get, you know, frozen asparagus and frozen artichokes needed on the plane. I could get up, right. I could travel and get stuff, frozen food in any supermarket across the country. It's not that hard to do it if you know what to do. Right. And, and let me, so the other question this brings to mind for me is you, you're talking about athletes, you're talking about high level athletes, um, protein, right? Cause, and I, I bet you hear that a lot. So how am I, how am I going to keep muscle mass if I'm not eating, you know, lots and lots of protein? So just Play with that question for half a second. I mean, what, so protein. Let's talk about the protein. Yeah, that, that's a good question because I think that if you asked me what was the most profound um, conclusions mm-hmm. of the scientific, of the nutritional science research of the last decade, and I would say that what the, what the most profound and shocking results were from the scientific literature was that more plant protein in the diet made for longer lifespans mm-hmm. and more animal protein in the diet made for shorter lifespans. Right. So we're juggling this. So we're trying to say that, yes, protein does play an issue because we used to think that the biological value of the protein was important. And since animal products had a higher biological protein, right. that it was more valuable. But now we know that the higher biological value protein gets converted into a hormone that ages us too, too readily. It converts into IGF-1. It's not stored as fat as easily as fat and carbohydrate. So the body converts the extra protein you don't need into IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1, which permits cancer cells to replicate and promotes cellular replication. There's other reasons why animal protein creates gram-negative bacteria and produce more pro-inflammatory compounds like trimethylamine oxide, more uric acid and urea and ammonia and other um, compounds that age us. But the but what we're, the shocking finding is that higher protein plant foods actually extend human lifespan by maintaining IGF-1 in that favorable range, not too low and not too high. Mm-hmm. So we're saying a macrobiotic diet, where a person is just eating rice or a fruit diet or an all potato diet, these are not good diets no. because they're not getting enough protein. The protein does play an issue and the plant foods that are high in protein that enable people to hit that, to tweak that optimal spot we're talking about green vegetables, beans, you know, black beans, navy beans, red beans, azuki beans, you know, beans, nuts and seeds, right? Mm-hmm. And certain grains like quinoa. But particularly the fact, I'm saying right here that the green vegetables, the beans, and the nuts and seeds are the constellation of foods people don't eat adequately. Mm-hmm. And that's a major factor short in their life. So we're talking here about... Two cooked foods, meaning cooked beans, because you have to cook them mm-hmm. to get them more digestible. Right. Cooked beans and cooked mushrooms. Mm-hmm. And two raw foods, raw onion and, and onion family and raw, and raw lettuces and raw green vegetables. You know, But both those things thicken the microbiome, mm-hmm. create gram positives and create a biofilm over the villi in the small intestines. Mm-hmm. And scientists call that the second meal effect because you have a, a thick... Um, barrier to microbes coming in and you have a thick barrier that slows the absorption of glucose through the wall of the digestive tract, lowering the glycemic load or the speed of glucose entry of any carbohydrate you eat. Whereas the saturated fats from animal products do the opposite. They distort the insulin receptor 
They make you more insulin resistant. So your body has to produce high amounts of insulin and they allow glucose to be absorbed rapidly and poke up and to bounce up to high levels in your bloodstream. So when you're on a diet with lots of meat and cheese, let's say, mm -hmm. now when you eat a mango or some oatmeal, your sugar goes real high. Mm -hmm. But when you're eating mushrooms and beans and you're on, your diet's low in saturated fats and it's taking in mostly the monounsaturated fats from nuts and seeds, mm -hmm. then you eat the mango and the sugars can, there's hardly even spikes of response. Hmm. So, the, so the glycemic defect of the moderate glycemic load food turns to a low glycemic load food based on the overall, your overall dietary portfolio. Mm -hmm. And then you get what scientists call gene silencing. Mm -hmm. Gene silencing means that we all have defects or you can say even inherited parts of our gene that's not the best, that's some right. defect or some methylation defects. Mm -hmm. But the body has the ability to recognize and silence those parts of genes that could lead to diseases when you have sufficient intake of these phytonutrients, especially green vegetable nutrients, and especially the green cruciferous vegetable family. The isothiocyanides, or the ITCs from green cruciferous vegetables, are so critical and important for gene silencing and their anti-cancer effects and there's stimulation of the antioxidant response element in the cell that removes methylation defects and removes carcinogens. Mm -hmm. So we're saying here that we really can control our, the way our body works and control, and, and control our health destiny by what we put in our mouth. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And, and I'm trying to, as, uh, as I'm asking you questions, I'm also help, uh, uh, I'm trying to um, get the, get the um, basically some of the the thinking in society out of if I don't eat enough, if I don't eat animal fats and I'm not going to have enough protein, I'm going to lose muscle. So I'm trying to kind of say, Hey, there's other helping open the door for there's other ways to get healthier protein. There we go. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. We got a display of strength. Oh, good for you. I love it. I love it. Um, and, and around this, I do want to ask you about intermittent fasting because that comes up a lot on our show. That's obviously very popular in culture. Now, how do you feel about intermittent fasting? Or fa fasting, I'll let you define kind of intermittent. What you know, some people are like sixteen hour, eighteen hour, twelve hour. But what's your take on fasting? Well, let me tell you the most important take home on that. Uh -huh. The most important take home is that our body needs extended time in the catabolic phase of the digestive cycle. Right. We need extended time when we're not digesting food. Right. And they're constantly putting food in your mouth every minute. But there's no because we detox and heal and reduce free radicals mm -hmm. in the non-digestive state. And the, in the eating phase, we're kind of like, we're accelerating aging. We have to eat, but we also have to not eat. Mm -hmm. So the take home here is, we do more healing in the, when we're sleeping at night. Right. And we get more healing done when we're sleeping and resting, if we're not digesting food at the same time as we're sleeping. Right. The most important take home is finish dinner early. Mm -hmm. Eat an earlier and lighter dinner. So when you go to bed at 10 o'clock at night, you've had four hours before you ate something and you're going to bed on an empty stomach. When you fall asleep at the night, you're getting full rest and full anti-aging phenomenon occurring because you're not digesting food at the same time as you're sleeping. So the worst thing you can do is eat a heavy and late dinner and digest food half the night when you're sleeping in the bed at night. Right. So yes, intermittent fasting has lots of scientific studies to document its value. Mm -hmm. But I think in a lot of cases, People use it in a, they use it to like restrict their diet to lose weight. And then they go out and they binge right. and it triggers them to emotionally overeat and put back weight. And they wind up going from one extreme to the other mm -hmm. instead of developing consistency in their behavior, in their habits that they need to be, have nutritional excellence. So intermittent fasting can be favorable, but it also can be unfavorable too, if the way people utilize it. Right. Like it could be favorable for me because I'm not going to binge after I don't eat right. for a half a day. Right. I can skip a dinner, eat lunch and skip a dinner one day or, or, or hardly or just have a piece of fruit for dinner and go to bed a little hungry one night mm -hmm. to intermittent fast. I'm not going to go and binge in a fast food restaurant and eat french fries the next day or something. Right. That, but if you, but a lot of people, they try to lose weight. They like skip, they'll try to eat really low. They'll go back and they'll eat a lot of food and gain it back again. And when you have your weight yo-yo up and down and gain and losing again, 
It's bad for people with an, an emotional relationship with food. It's bad mm-hmm. for people with food addiction. It just is not, it's just not good to them to go from one extreme to the other. So I really would prefer to people to get consistency in their habits, but gradually lose about two pounds to three pounds a week, mm-hmm. get to your mm-hmm. ideal weight, stay there, and then utilize the concepts of intermittent fasting to recognize not to eat, between, not to snack, not to eat between meals, and to eat an early and light dinner and so uh, it's better to eat breakfast, by the way. It's better to eat breakfast and lunch and skip dinner or eat breakfast and lunch and a lighter, earlier dinner. Right. And then just so keeping in mind, the whole key here is to go to bed on an empty stomach. OK, and I appreciate the clarification. And so you're, you, you validate that intermittent fasting is good for recovery. It's just how you how you use it, if you're using it as a tool versus as a way to uh, restrict things or make yourself crazy. Right. I mean, you, it, it, you can misuse uh, fasting if you're if, if if you're doing it just to lose weight and you don't add in the nutrients and you don't add in the right sleep and you're doing it the wrong hours and you know I, I see so many people misuse it and I mm-hmm. see so many people have done extended water fasts and don't eat anything for two to three weeks to lose weight oh my gosh. and 95 percent of them bounce back and wind up a year or two later with more weight than they were yeah. before they before they started from it gets there you know when they have this addictive mentality they've never mm-hmm. trained their taste buds and really gotten rid of their food addiction changed their outlook on food in the world mm-hmm. they go on these extreme diets or even fasting which could be good in the right circumstances and they just used it as a quick fix right and they didn't change the psychological and emotional and habits yet to fix their, so they don't really maintain the beneficial diet and they wind up slowing the metabolic rate down and now gaining weight at even faster rate after they did this period of caloric restriction. So I have to be very cautious and that's why one of the reasons I built this retreat here Mm -hmm. and people come for two or three months because we want them to develop the repetition, the the dedication, the consistency, the pattern that they can feel good about and make it taste good and feel that they can leave and repeat the same pattern at home and stay consistent with it, you know, week in, month out, year in and year out. So if they have more weight to lose, they keep gravitating towards their ideal weight and they get rid of this yo-yo dieting mentality. Right. Eat healthfully and stick with it. Right, you know? exactly. And and so that comes to the, the next part of what I want, really want to talk about, which is, you know, here... Uh, in a little over a month, we're doing the Global Happiness Summit, our 2022 Global Happiness Summit. We're bringing in all these speakers to talk about happiness, but really what, you know, happiness is a, uh, a side effect of things that you're doing in your life, right? If you've got negative, uh, if, if you're watching the news all the time, guess what? You're not probably going to be very happy if you've got a negative stimulus all the time. But really what we're talking about here is food can also be a negative stimulus. So what effect does this have, you know, changing to this type of diet, what effect does it have on the brain and what effect does it have on mood? That's a, such a great question. I wrote a book on that, by the way, called Fast Food Genocide. That's the name of the book, oh, wow. Fast Food Genocide. Yeah. yeah, it talks. It's one of my favorite books that I've written. It, it's, the, it's the one that's not the new, that has not, not become <laughs> the New York Times bestseller. You right, know what I mean? <laughs> right. Because yeah, I sell more books, I write about you know ending diabetes or reversing right, heart right, disease, right. losing weight. You sell more books, you know. But right. but fast. So, but yes, there's a dose dependent relationship between the consumption of commercial baked goods mm-hmm. and fast food and major depression. So much so that even two servings a week can induce major depression in large in large part of the population. Wow. So we're talking, and there's also a relationship between candy consumption in childhood. And whether you are arrested for violent criminal behavior or for drug abuse when you're an adult by the age of 35. Wow. And if if you're in the highest quintile of candy consumption as a child and junk food and fast food consumption as a child, then you Mm -hmm. wind up have a 60 percent chance of having a history of being arrested for drug abuse or violent criminal activity by the time you're 35 years old, by the way. Wow. So we're saying the most, it's almost the most powerful association more than being raised in an abusive or right. socially isolated family or having poverty. The, 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 the consumption of food has a huge effect on mental function here. Mm-hmm. And we're, so we're talking about that one in 500 Americans used to be mentally ill, now it's one in five Americans. Right. So, men, so definitely mental illness, depression is ubiquitous. We have a nation of dysthymic people living on fast food. So even if these foods don't make you this pre- depressed, they make you no longer excited about living. You don't wake up every day excited about your life, looking for the beauty around you, the beauty of the world, having goodwill for other people, trying to get things done, passionate, excited about your creativity. They dummy you down and they make you live to make some money so you can spend it on your 
self-destructive addictions like alcohol or fast food or junk food or drugs or so a lot of Americans are living in this cycle of you know working staying dysthymic not too happy or excited mm-hmm. about life mm-hmm. and then being in a self consuming self-destructive substances that they're addicted to so the side of, so so if you know the the moral of the story is if you want to be happy and less depressed eat food that's good for you right right i mean and i because you it's kind of back to the old adage you know that you are what you eat to some degree i mean if 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 you're eating stuff that is just low energetic, energetic food, you're going to have low energy. There's, I mean, and, and, and it's not just, I think so often as I grew up in the Midwest, you know, there's so often a disassociation with what I eat and how I feel or what I eat. And it's affecting me in a way. It's just like, no, I got to eat because I need more energy or, you know, it's, it's here, it's dinner time, it's breakfast. And, and there's not any thought to it. There's not any relationship to it. It seems like the, in fact, and now it seems like as a society, there's at least awareness of coming back to the, your relationship with everything, but it's, you know, with food, your relationship with food is affecting you, whether you want to admit it or acknowledge it or not. I mean, there's all these things about overeating and emotional overeating and, and all that stuff. But we're, I'm really saying, we're kind of diving in here of like, literally the food is going to make you, whether you eat this or this, it literally makes you feel differently because it's some of it's chemical, right? Some of it's actual the way the chemicals are affecting your body and your brain and the neurotoxins. When you talk about sugar, it makes me think, you know, That's right. most neuro- neurologists are going to tell you that sugar is a neurotoxin and you're literally poisoning yourself but you're, because it's, the synapses aren't firing correctly, right? Yeah. And I'm saying white flour mm-hmm. is a sugar equivalent. Yes, I agree. Yep. It's, not, it's not a food, it's a drug. Right. Because a food, it doesn't contain s- s- the materials to sustain human life. Right. And it has a negative effect on human lifespan. So we're saying here that the majority of calories consumed by America the more is white flowers and oils. And they right. just have, they have so many negative that they can't expect to have normalcy. They have to um, live in fear of disease and running to back and forth to doctors and hospitals will, and have their body deteriorate and be very unhealthy and think that it's normal. Right. To, to have high blood pressure and heart disease and cancers and getting all these screening tests and having freight and having blood tests and running back and forth to doctors your whole life, thinking your body's ready to break down at any minute, instead of the confidence and optimism and enthusiasm that you know your body protects you and has the, and your body is a self-protective, self-healing machine mm-hmm. that doesn't want, that when, when fed right, doesn't get sick. You know, so we're talking about that food control our genes don't decide what kind of diet's good for us by the way mm-hmm. our diet controls what kind of genes we have because our genes and our dna changes and develops in response to what we put in our body and that's what people don't recognize yeah i've never heard that i've actually never heard that before so that is a new perspective mm-hmm. that your the food you're eating is affecting and changing your genes and your dna that's correct interesting Wow, that's a lot of good stuff. So for people, so uh, even, so even well, I'll say for me, um, so what are good resources? Because there, there, we covered a lot of stuff today, and people could feel certainly overwhelmed with, uh, that's just too much stuff and I can't do it. Because, you know, you got to, so, yeah. so what, how, do, how do people begin? Or if people are already on the path, but how do people begin to kind of, make this part of their diet. So what resources, you've got some resources available. I wanted to talk about those. Obviously you've got books out. You said you had a membership as well um, to something. So, yeah. so, so kind of how do people learn more, educate themselves more, and then start to apply this? Right. I think, you know, I, my books are, I think are really a good place to start. And my mm-hmm. latest book, most recent one with the most updated research is called eat for life mm-hmm. is a great place to start because I used to, when I wrote eat to live in 2000, it was published in 2004 I wrote right in the beginning of the book, don't start eating this way. Don't make a decision about doing this. First, read the information. Get, get the information so it becomes part of who you are as a person, so you have the knowledge. Mm-hmm. Then you'll find it much easier to do it if you know why you're doing it. Don't just do it because somebody tells you to do something. Make sure the science and the logic and the, and, the, and the research supports it, and it's really well done research, which is not just a person, you know, it's, you, you know, check the references, see if it's adequately referenced. And the person is, on, in other words, I'm saying to people, get the knowledge. Right. Uh, you know, I do, my website is drfurman.com. Mm-hmm. We have a whole supportive amount of information there, including a membership where people communicate with other people doing it and share recipes and ask me questions and have meetups and food, you know, and parties and stuff like that. So, but of course, um, you know, a good place, you know, they should start somewhere and they're starting to collect more information about it. And I think this is super fun. Mm-hmm. You know, eating healthfully is not like a 
being in a prison. It's not doing, it's not, we're not depriving ourselves. We're expanding ourselves and, 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 and appreciating the value of food more, learning how to make great healthy food taste great and living a life with a much more positive attitude and with fearlessness, creativity, and the ability to have goodwill for people because we're, exa- we're all setting ourselves up as an example of good health, which then rubs off on people around us as well. And being able to be active and fully enjoying our lives as we age is really critical too. And, and certainly you are a product of your, of your uh, diet um, or eating lifestyle, because obviously just even talking to you, I can tell how much passion you have, how much energy you have, how much vim and vigor you, I mean, it's just like you, you're alive, I guess, is what I want to say. You can just feel the life in you. And I'm sure that's a benefit of 35 years of you doing this and, and helping other people do it, right? Because it's not only that you're doing it for yourself, but you're also imparting this knowledge to others, which is a sense of purpose and gives us even more connection with the world and more connection with those around us, right? We have we have a Absolutely. reason to live, right? Versus just uh, being around. So certainly appreciate that. You'd already mentioned the website. We mentioned the book. Um, certainly we'll put that in the show notes as well, but I loved having you on today. Please come back. We'd love to have you on the Global Happiness Summit. We'd love to have you come back if you, you know, and update us and keep us up to speed as uh, things evolve for you, as you know, your community grows. And if you want to share more, we, you know, a big part of what we're doing now uh, that we've rebranded to the Bright Vibe podcast is really how do we help raise the vibration of the world? How do we help raise the vibration of each other? How do we make that vibration literally brighter? Because to your point, the more we do that for ourselves, the more we do it for our community, the more we do it for our families, the more we do it for the world. So it's got to start with us. We, you know, we got to... Right take care of us or meaning make adjustments in your own life. But then naturally people will want to know what, well, why, man, you seem like you have a ton of energy. What, what's going on? Well, here's what I'm doing. Da, 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 da. And you should you know, go to Dr. Furman's site and look, here's what I've done. Right. So really loved having you on the show today. Uh, so appreciate your time today. And uh, thank you for doing all the great work you're doing. Thank you, Matt. You too. Looking forward to the next time. Thank you for being a part of the bright vibe podcast. For more information, go to brightvibe.com. That's B-R-I-T-E, vibe, V-I-B-E.com. Thank you for listening.